You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast, season three, episode 27. Justin Steele takes a tumble in Texas. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow on all the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Email us, fly the W670 at gmail.com. Well, Crowley, welcome back from uh, Texas and uh, Globe Life Stadium. We'll get into the games in a minute, but first I uh, want to get your uh, impressions uh, of Texas and uh, Globe Life. Well, yeah, Globe Life Stadium, we actually did the tour, right? Oh, okay, and so the it's, tour as well, wow. Right. You touched, so you touched all the bases, pun intended. All the bases. Now, it's funny because they have three stadiums all right next to each other. Uh, the AT&T, which is the Cowboys, which is just ginormous. It just made me think of Arlington Heights. They got to do that in Arlington Heights. Um, they also have their old stadium they keep up called Choctaw Stadium, which is um, they, they have like rugby and uh, I don't know what it's called, XFL, UFL, whatever the knockoff NFL thing is. So they're using that stadium. And then they have Globe Life Stadium, which has the biggest retractable roof in the world. And so this thing just goes kind of straight back and opens up into one, in one piece. Okay. It was absolutely amazing. Was uh, the I really roof ever open or no? Not when we were there, which I thought was kind of dumb. There's no reason like on Saturday night that they didn't have it open, but um, it, it really is a nice stadium that, you know, the bricks are really nice. They have a lot of different vending, all sorts of things. I'm just going to tell you, there's a couple things that annoy me. I, I, I got to go this route here. Number one, <laughs> Dustin, number one, they have like football cheerleaders at a baseball game. Okay. Different. I don't, I, I don't, I don't get that. I've never, I, I've never okay. seen that before. We've got a we you know the Cubs used to have a ball girl, but yeah, Marla yeah. Collins, Marla right, Collins. Right, right. But uh, this was a little cheerleaders. They didn't actually like get balls. They just you know doing the kicks and all that stuff. The other thing, and this has always been a rule of mine, Dustin, is if you have to have on the jumbotron to tell your fans every time to get loud, then you got some crappy fans. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to be mean, man, but you got to. It's so annoying. It's yeah. so you gotta annoying. Know when to get loud, right? Yep. Right. It's like constant. Get loud. Turn it eleven. I'm like. Dude, you don't know when to do that. The other thing, just too much music and smoke for my liking. Maybe it's the traditionalist in me, but like every time they got to a two strike count, like a Cubs hitter got to a two strike count, they would play Hell's Bells every time. I'm like, Jesus, like in a game, you think how many times you get to two strikes? It was a little much, I, but, yeah. but in general, I enjoyed well, everything's this over the top, right? In Texas, everything's over right. The top. Everything's yeah. bigger in Texas, but. I, I, I enjoyed it there. The the Texas Live is is this complex and it's very similar to Ballpark Village in St. Louis. And they have one in Atlanta where they have like this huge middle area with tons of TVs. And obviously with the uh, March Madness going on, that was a big deal. And then they have all sorts of different restaurants within the, the complex. And so that was a blast, you know, so you could sit there, they have bands playing like all the time, they have outdoor venues, indoor venues, any kind of food and drink that you now, want. Now, do you need a ticket? Do you need a ticket to the game to get into that area or no? No, you do not okay. need a ticket to get into so that. You could just kind of go there and like pre tailgate, watch the game, hang out and just sit there the whole time. The game's on TV. Right. And, okay. and, and not only that, they do tailgate pretty hard out there. They have like 40 parking lots. I'm like, Jesus. So there's a lot of tailgating going on. All right, cool. Very fun. All right, so let's get into it. I mean, that game on Thursday, Crowley, had a little bit of everything. And I got to be honest, it already feels like that was like a week ago. And it was just a couple <laughs> days ago. But I, 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 do, I still I don't understand when you're playing a game in a domed stadium, why you needed to take Friday off. It, it really made no sense. And so, we're, you know, we, we go to there and they do their banner raising ceremony. I guess like, okay, I'm biased. You know, I was at the banner raising ceremony for the Cubs. I was at the uh, ring ceremony for the Cubs, but it was just like, okay. It was like, you know, they made some, you know, comments. Bochi came out and, and, and I think Chris Young, and I can't remember, I think a player came out and, you know, they talked for a few minutes and then they unfurled the banner, which it, it was like no big deal. Right. And so, you know, we're pumped up for the game and we take a look at Craig Council's, you know, first lineup. And one of the first things, Dustin, that we see is Christopher Morell, who we heard all all spring was going to be taking third base, was DHing, yep. and Nick Madrigal was third base. Um, I have no problem. I like Ian Happ at the top. And I know I know the logic behind having Suzuki and Bellinger getting the most at bats. 
So I guess it wasn't a big deal. It just was just funny to me that they would have Nick Magical at third after kind of hyping up Christopher Morrell this whole time. So. Right. They did do a good job, meaning Council did go, do a good job pregame explaining why he did that in game number one. And he also basically said, when Justin Steele pitches again, I guess, you know, when is a big question. We'll get to that in a minute. But you're going to see a defensive-minded third baseman because of the way the ball comes out of his hand. And if things are going right, the ball is going to be going to third base a lot. And I think the first play of the game, right? I think the first the first batter, the Rangers put up the, the bat, grounded out to the third baseman. So it looked like that was the right move. Right. And, the, and, and another right move was having Christopher Morrell, right, where we, he was hitting in the cleanup spot because – you know, he hit a leadoff triple in the second yep. and immediately scoring on a Dansby Swanson sack fly. I just love the fact that Dansby had a good at bat, did not strike out just with no option. Got that run back in the fourth when Josh Young hit a one out double. And what ends up happening here is that Adolis Garcia scalded one to Nick Magical with an exit below of 106. I mean, that's a rocket, Dustin. Right. I mean, but it was hit. It was hit hard, but it was really aggravating. It was right at him. And and, and here's the thing, Dustin. The Cubs are, the Cubs don't have an above average third baseman on this roster defensively, right? No. Magical doesn't make the play. I don't think Morell would have made the play. I don't think Patrick Wisdom would have made the play. So that's where we are, and that's what we're going to have to talk about and deal with pretty much this entire season. That put runners at the corner, and Young would score on a Wyatt Langford sack fly to tie the game at one. But the fifth inning is when disaster strikes for the Cubs. Justin Steele's cruising, right? He pitches four innings. He gave up one run on two hits with one walk and six Ks against that really tough Rangers lineup. But And again, Dustin, that could have easily been an error, that run and one of those hits. Right. Um, right. In that inning, though, Ezekiel Duran leads off with a double. Evan Carter hits one to Dansby, so the Cubs get Duran in a run down for the first out. There's a runner at first, one out. Leody Tavares lays down a sack bunt, and Steele runs and makes a fantastic play, but he stumbles, immediately grabs his left hamstring. He's taken out of the game. And, Dustin, this was a surprise for me because there's two outs in the inning. Julian Merriweather come, came in and got the final out. But that you know, now you have the bullpen's gonna have to take it the rest of the way. And and so we'll talk more about Steele's injury in the third segment. But that was our worst nightmare right there, seeing Justin Steele grabbing at that hammy. Yeah, about the worst um thing you could have thought of that happened in that first uh first game for the Cubs, no doubt about that. Now the Cubs retook the lead in the six back to back doubles by Suzuki and Bellinger put the Cubs up two to one. But Andalas Garcia untied it with one out with Yancey Almonte. Gave up the home run. That's a blast that landed in Oklahoma to tie the game back up in the bottom of the inning. I guess, Dustin, I was surprised that Almonte didn't come in in the fifth when Steele came out for just to get one out and then have um, Merriweather take you know the, the sixth inning. I thought that would have been something I would have done, but that was surprising. But it was in the ninth, Dustin, when things got goofy. It, with one out, Jose Leclerc will walk Michael Bush and Nico Horner back to back. And hey, Jose Leclerc didn't have a great weekend, just like I didn't have a great Cubs weekend. Um, with Miles Mastrobuani pitch hitting, the ball gets by catcher Jonah Heim. He's arguing with the home plate umpire saying that ball was tipped. But Michael Bush never stops running and scores. Dustin, replays show that it was a foul tip. But it's not a reviewable play, and the Cubs are up three to two in the ninth. Two How things. stupid, though! How stupid that that's <laughs> not a reviewable play. I mean, even even you know one of the best Cub fans out there, uh, our guy Ron Coomer talked about with Mully and Haw Friday morning. I mean, that's just a dumb thing. We've got the technology; get the plays right. Even though that would have gone against the Cubs, get the plays right. I 100% agree with you. It was crap. And if it would have happened the other way, we would have been furious, right? Oh, my gosh, would we have been furious. But there's no reason. Balls and strikes, I understand not replaying them. And eventually, the ABS system is going to be part of MLB. But there's no reason on a play like that that you can't review it. I, I don't. As long as you have your review, you should be able to review it. It's about Absolutely. that simple. Yep. Totally and, and you agree. Know what? I mean, if we can review it watching on Marquee or watching on the four-letter network, then why in the world can't they do it in New York? 
Right. And and let's just say something here, though. Good heads up play by Bush to keep running. You know, oh, that was great. probably the best thing he did all weekend. Right. <laughs> right. Jonah Heim, you know, he afterwards, you know, he, he acknowledged he made a mistake that you don't do that. And then you, you play it and then argue your case after the right, play is done. Right. And right. Dead, he, looked, but... he looked like a young he looked like a young player in that spot. So the Cubs are up three, two in the ninth. In comes Edward Alzley. I don't think he gave up a run all spring. Right. To pick up the save. Seven games in spring training, pitched seven innings, gave up three hits, no runs. The very first batter he faces is Travis Janikowski, pinch hitter, journeyman, in his 10th season in the majors. Dustin, in the nine previous seasons, how many home runs has Travis Janikowski hit? No idea. 10. 10, okay. So he hits one home run a season. He added number 11 to tie the game in the ninth. Our friend John Moore, who was on the podcast from the Rangers Daily Podcast, he asked Janikowski, are you incorporating power in your game now? He's like, nope, that's my one for the year. So I don't get mad, Dustin, if you give up a home run to Adolis Garcia or Corey Seager. But come on, Travis Janikowski, come on, man. Right. I mean, yep. no good. The last guy. And again, I mean, that they probably thought they could get away with it, right? I mean, that's part of probably why they, they approached the way they did because they didn't think they had to worry about it. So now it goes into extras man for man on second, former cub, David Robertson on the mound, pinch hitter, Garrett Cooper strikes out. You can't have the bat on your shoulder. It was looking, striking out, looking, you got to move that runner over. You can't worst. take that strikeout. It's the worst. It's the worst, the worst, the worst striking out, looking in that situation. Yep. Hap would walk Suzuki grounded to advance to runners. Boat. She smartly intentionally walks Cody Bellinger to face yep. Morell. Morell fouled the first pitch he saw towards left. Dustin, I'm right there in on left field. If it stays fair, it would have been a grand slam instead. Foul ball. Oh yeah. And I mean that pitcher, that pitcher inside the dugout afterwards was like it was that blank and close. That blank and close. I mean, it was close. So he instead he fouls out, ends the inning. Drew Smiley comes in. And Corey Seager does exactly what you do, right? He grounds out. Simeon moves to third. He executes. Smiley walks a couple better to load the bases. Um, Wyatt Langford is going to ground out. Master Boney throws out uh, Simeon at home plate. So you got two outs in Jonah Heim. The guy who argued with the ump and, and, and gave the Cubs the lead in the ninth, he gets the game-winning hit, and the Cubs lose game one, four to three. I mean, it just – And that one had everything, Crowley. That, that game – had a little bit of everything in it, right? You had the the home runs, you had the injury, you had the drama, you had the man for man. I mean, just a little bit of everything. It felt like playoff baseball on the very first night of the season. Right. I was trying to remind myself 161 more to want to get oh, my right, right. A heart attack. Yep. Uh huh. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. You know, so hey, you know, you lose, it happens, but it just I was just frustrated with the steel injury and 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 again the Travis Janikowski home run. So I say to myself, all right, game two, Kyle Hendricks versus Cody Bradford. We're gonna get this back, right? The Rangers celebrated their ring ceremony. I know I'm biased, pretty uneventful. They came out of the dugout, got their ring on the stage, whatever. Um, but here's the thing. Cub fans, I think a lot of them flew in either Thursday or Friday because the a lot more Cub fans in attendance on Saturday, larger contingency, and you heard them loud and clear when Kyle Hendricks got out of a jam in the first with runners at second and third. Sam makes a spectacular play on a sinking in between her between the between himself and the infielders. He struck out Josh Young to end the threat, and I'm pumped up. And I'm thinking that Hendricks is going to get locked in. You made a mistake. You didn't score off Hendricks. Now he's going to lock it down. And then Cub fans got really loud in the second one. Christopher Morell singled. And then who had Dansby Swanson hitting the Cubs' first home run on the season? Right. I don't know, but two nothing lead. That was a, that was a nice homer. He crushed it. Yeah. And the fans are cheering. Let's go, Cubby, and it's all good. But that was the last you would hear from the Cub fans. Rangers went to town on Kyle Hendricks. Jared Walsh with the two-run home run in the bottom of the inning to tie it. Adolis Garcia hit a two-run homer the next inning, put the Rangers up 4-2. He gave, Hendricks gave up another run in the fifth before he was replaced by Quas, who put out the fire by getting Adolis Garcia to strike out with the bases loaded. So for Hendricks, he went 3.2 innings, gave up five runs on nine hits, two walks, two Ks, two two-run homers. 
Dustin was still getting injured early in game one. That was the last thing the council was looking for short out. Right. Well, it's the two, it's the two, two run homers, right. That really stings. Um, you don't expect that out of Kyle Hendricks, not, not even a little bit, but again, the, the Cubs were playing the defending world series champions and they won the ring and were able to undo that banner for a reason. I mean, that lineup is absolutely stacked. Right. And you cannot fall behind them. They take their walks. And, and, and I think that's the thing is that Hendricks just couldn't get strike one. He was, he was fighting his own mechanics and you know, you're going to pay against that team. A uh, couple little notes from this game. Luke Lidl made a season's debut in the six. He gave up a double, but struck out a batter and didn't give up a run. The seventh Ben Brown was called up that same day. We're going to talk about that in segment three, one of the top pitching prospects. We've had him as a guest on the fly, the W podcast. He works the he walks the first battery of face, but got a ground out strikeout and line out to end the innings. So after seven innings, Dustin, the Cubs are only down three runs, right? Bloop and a blast is all you need to get back in it. In the eighth inning, though, it was a disaster for Ben. But I think the defense is what really bothered me. The first batter, Jared Walsh, hit one that went off the glove of Dansby Swanson. Initially, it was ruled an error, but then it was changed back to a hit. Don't get it. After, yeah, after I, the, I don't get I don't get caught up in those things. The, the bottom line is, Dansby made a bad play. And, right. And defense and the, the Cubs in general, for as much as as an organization as they like to talk about stressing defense and relying on defense, th th their defense wasn't very good in this series. No, and not only that, after giving up a double, you know, it was ruled an error, changed back to hit. They gave up a double and a walk to load the bases. Marcus Simeon hits one that goes off the glove of Christopher Morrell. I mean, I, I was close to the play. I was on Saturday. I had really good seats. And in my opinion, that's a play that has to get made that Morrell has to make. Yep. Yep. He needed to make that play. He had a play in the, in the game three on Sunday as well. That was not so hot. Right. So the Rangers score six runs in the eighth. Josh Young hit a two run homer to punctuate it. Cubs are trailing 11 to two. Brown went 1.2 innings. He gave up three runs on five hits, two walks. But to me, two of those hits should have been scored in errors. But you, the other thing, and, and you're seeing this with Luke, and whether it's Ben Brown, whether it's Jordan Wicks uh, today on Sunday, you are not going to get away with those walks against especially good teams in MLB, even the bad teams. You, 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 got, you cannot fall behind. You cannot walk these guys. It'll come back to bite you. Yep, come back to bite you, and it definitely bit them. No doubt about that. Game three, I said to everybody, Cubs are going to win today because I'm leaving Texas. Jordan Wicks versus John Gray. Cubs came out strong early with one out, say a single. Cody Bellinger walked, and then Christopher Morrell homered to left center for his first dinger. But like you talked about, Dustin, with Morrell, you take the good, you take the bad. In the bottom of the second with one out, Kinzinger hit one to Morrell, who made a bad throw and was charged with an error. Jared Walsh grounded out for the second out, should have been the third, but then Wicks lost his control, gave up back-to-back -back walks, and a single by Simeon made it 3-2. to two. The Cubs would add two more in the fourth when Ian Happ hit a double to score Talkman, and Amaya was able to score thanks to a fielding error by uh, Leody Tavares. And the Cubs had some breathing room with a 5-2 to two lead. That wouldn't last long in the bottom of the inning. Jared Walsh singled Aaron Carter, reached on a fielder's choice, um, and everyone was safe on an error by Dansby Swanson. So that could have been two errors in two days, Dustin, if it right. wasn't for the hometown scoring. Yeah. Uh, Simeon doubled to make it 5-3, and then rookie sensation Wyatt Langford tripled to tie the game at 5. Wicks goes four innings, gives up five runs. Again, only two of them earned. Right. Uh, errors. Again, these errors. I mean, I'm just, just shocked by the shoddy defense to start this year off. Right. He walked three, which you can't do six no, Ks. No walks. Yeah. But the bullpen, Dustin, came through this time really lighter. Nice. Really nice. Yep. Merriweather pitched two. Naris, they all held it down. Tied in the ninth, ninth Dustin. The Cubs loaded the bases with one out. Miles Masterbuani hits a force out. Texas gets the runner out at home. So now you got bases loaded, two outs. Ian Happ draws a basics loaded walk. Great at bat. Another, 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 another great at bat by him. I mean, on base five times in today's ballgame. I absolutely love him leading off. I've said it long, <laughs> long and hard. And finally, uh, people, someone's listening here. Say a single to make it eight to five. And Bellinger with a insurance run to make it nine to five. Albert Alzali want to see how he would respond after blowing it on Thursday night. Pitch a scoreless ninth as the Cubs avoid the sweep. Manager Craig Council gets his first Cub win. Ian Happ, four for five, two RBIs. Say a two for six with two RBIs. Cody Bellinger, one for three with three walks. Amaya, two for four. And Talkman with three walks. So, you know what? I didn't get to see a win in Texas. That's okay. That just means I have to go back to Globe Life Stadium in the future. Go back indeed. 
This is the Fly the W670 podcast. It's season three. It's episode 27. Justin Steele takes a tumble in Texas. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Our guy Crowley spent opening weekend with a group called Cub Fans in Oklahoma. Diehard group of fans that gravitated to the Cubs thanks to the uh, superstation WGN. In this segment, Crowley talks to the founder of the group, Wes Jameson. And Hall of Famer Fergie Jenkins about opening weekend and their love, just like ours, of Cub baseball. I am here with legendary Cub fan Wes Jamison, the leader of Cub fans in Oklahoma, CFIO. Wes, how did this group get started? Man, this group got started back when Iowa Cubs, uh, it was 2013, they came to play the Oklahoma City Red Hawks, which were the AAA affiliate for the Rangers at the time. Um, I noticed there was like a ton of Cubs fans at the game and I was like, man, like this would be so awesome if like we all knew each other and we all hung out and like watch a World Series game eventually one day. So I went home, made like little business cards, came back the next game and like just started passing them out there. We created a Facebook group, passed them out and like for the first couple of years we, we were about 500 strong and then obviously 2015 like things just blew up and then 2016. Uh, Chicago Tribune did a story about us. Uh, WGN did a couple stories about us. Um, the Daily Oklahoma, the newspaper there in town, did a story about us. And like the, the group just went nuts. How many members would you say you have now? Uh, right now, I think we're around like three, three to four thousand, something like that. Three to four thousand. And one of the cool things that you guys do is that there's a lot of great baseball players that have passed through the Oklahoma system. Um, and, and you guys always have a big going away party before the season starts. Who are some players that have attended these parties? Yeah, so we do, uh, it's called, we do the annual spring training send off at, uh, we have a Chicago style restaurant up in Tulsa, Oklahoma called Savistano's. Uh, and they host all of our watch parties. And, uh, God, man, got, got pretty loud, got pretty loud there for a minute. Um, but no, we have uh, prospects like Cole Franklin. Uh, Cade Horton, Thomas Hatch has been there uh, back when he was with our organization, uh, Caleb Knight, um, and then the other guys in our organization, Cade Horton, uh, he couldn't make it right this year. That dude is focused on, on making the show this year. And so you decided, hey, you know what, because I, I've seen Cub fans in Oklahoma, I've seen them at Cubs convention, I've seen them at Wrigley Field, I've seen them at Club 400. But for you guys, when, when all of a sudden you see that they're opening up against the Texas Rangers, it's just south of you guys, right? Yeah, two and a half hours. How excited were you and how quick did you jump into action? Oh, man, like, so this happened to get, uh, in 2019 as well. Uh, it's the closest the Cubs are going to get to us. And so, like, we get super excited anytime they come to Texas. But when opening day, like, bro, you can't beat the weather in Texas in late March, early April. Uh, so, man, we get fired up. Like, uh, I got a ticket rep with the Rangers that I've dealt with uh, in 19 and then again this year. I just call him immediately um, and just get the ball rolling on it. So how many people are going to be, how many Cub fans in Oklahoma are going to have tickets for today's Saturday's game? For Saturday's game, we sold, like, a little over 900 tickets. 900 tickets. 900 so tickets. we're going to be sitting in Section 104. We have, uh, we have sections one, two, three, and four. We have 50 seats in one, two, three, and four. Uh, we got like 100 seats in sections 104 and 105. And then the whole left field, like Ian Happ is going to hear Cubs fans <laughs> because the whole left field bleachers is Cubs fans in Oklahoma. That, that, so this, this is going to be awesome. So it's going to be kind of behind the first base dugout and all of left field are going to be cub fans in yes. oklahoma and this has just been we're at texas live now it's just been a great to get a great get together and, and i appreciate you putting this all together and and when you think about you know wgn and the legacy of wgn and the chicago cubs and 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 the memories and, and the fandom that was created by that it's just incredible to see you know i never would have thought all these cup fans in Oklahoma, yeah. but you guys are loud and proud, man. I'll tell and that you that. was, you know, like, like you said, WGN is the reason, um, in Oklahoma. I mean, obviously we're closer to the Rangers. We're close to the Cardinals, but we really didn't get them on TV a lot. Um, you either had the Braves or you had the Cubs. The Cubs not having any night games as we're growing up. Like you get home from school, you watch the Cubs. Um, and I think that's really what, what has grown this group to what it is. I mean, just everybody coming home from school 
had one thing to watch. It was either Saved by the Bell or the Cubs. And <laughs> luckily, most of us picked the Cubs. And you are also a uh, Little League coach. You coached Kate Horton? I did coach Kate Horton. I was assistant coach. Uh, Chad was the head coach. And, and same question there. When you saw, you know, there's times where you see greatness and it stands out. Did you right away, when you saw Kate Horton, just say to yourself, oh, my God, this, this kid's something special? Yeah, so um, the first team that we had, we were the Cubs, um, obviously. And he was our shortstop. And I'll never forget, I mean, we're four or five years old. And a kid hits the ball off the tee, like, a nice line drive. And Cade Horton, like, lays out, like, lays out and catches it in the air. Like, I mean, like you would see, like, a professional baseball player. And I looked at Chad, and I'm like, what the hell do we have here? Like, it, it was just, yeah, it was insane. Like, the things he was doing at that age was just unbelievable. And, and then when you saw him again later on as he got older, I mean, then all of a sudden, obviously, he sprouts up. He's, he's, he's a giant. And then all of a sudden now it had to have been just a totally different level. Yeah. Uh, I, w I was disappointed he went to the University of Oklahoma because I'm a big Oklahoma State guy. Uh, <laughs> but, man, he went to college and, and the, what he did in the Big 12 tournament and the World College World Series was just ridiculous. Um, and then when he got drafted by the Cubs, just like a dream come true. Like, uh, I, just, I didn't expect the Cubs to take him at seven. Um, I we because you know I talked to him before the draft and we really thought you know he we, we knew it would be first round we thought late first round um, all the projections had him late first round nobody had the Cubs taking him and then when when you're the Cubs select Kate Horton it was like you almost had to like stop and like be like is this real life for a minute like it was just nuts and you guys had to have been jumping on the couches uh, was, screaming yeah um, I matter of fact I still have a video somewhere of Jenkins when they announced Kate Horton like just going nuts because obviously like. Our Oklahoma elite family, like, we follow these guys. I mean, we've got a guy um, with the Tampa Bay Rays right now. we got a guy with the Blue Jays now. So, like, we follow these guys. Uh, but for us being Cubs fans, it was just, it was special. And I talked to Chad earlier. Good possibility, not saying it's going to happen, but good possibility that Kay Horton may be called up at some point in time in the 2024 season. Yeah. How quick will you be buying your plane tickets to Wrigley Field? It'll be quick, man. My mom's already on dime. My mom works for American Airlines. Hey, we'll be first class. <laughs> Six, ah. 630 flight from Will Rogers to O'Hare. Hey, man, I'm looking forward. I'll be there myself. Thank you for putting this all together. It doesn't happen without someone like you that has the dedication and passion, Wes. I appreciate everything you do and having us out here. Oh, Crowley, good, good, to, good to have you in our part of town. <laughs> Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, I have Hall of Famer Fergie Jenkins. Fergie, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Now, you had a 19-year MLB career. Ten of it with the Cubs, six of it with the Rangers. When you got a Cubs versus Rangers game, I'm going hardball early. No softballs, Fergie. Where are your loyalties lying right now in this type of game? Well, I'd like to see both teams play well because I had a chance to meet a lot of the different players from both ball clubs. I was over 30 days free training with the Cubs. I, you know, my favorite team is still with the Cubs, but uh, I just want to see them play well. Now, Fergie, you went on an incredible run, six years, 20-game winner, which I don't think we're ever going to see that again. But in 1974, you end up with 20, you end up with 25 wins. We're at the 50th anniversary of that. What made that season with the Rangers so special to get 25 wins? Well, it was a new team for me, leaving the National League, Gold American League, new manager, Billy Martin, new teammates. I just thought that if I could stay healthy enough, uh, I could win a lot of ball games, and I, I told Billy Martin that. Uh, that, that was like question mark. Said I had a bad arm, because I didn't win twenty games my seventh season. You still won fourteen. Fourteen, <laughs> but see, that's not enough, you know. But I, I just think that uh, I just try to prove to myself I could still win. Now, what was it like playing for Billy Martin? I mean, that that had to have been. You probably have some good stories, but what was he like? I mean, you played for Leo DeRocher and Billy Martin. That had to have been insane. What was the difference, would you say, between the two? Well, one was the devil and the other was devil's partner. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Martin was tough. You know, he, he wanted uh, the, the excellence from every every time he went out there. And that's what I tried to prove. I could pitch and win, and I proved that. Uh, so like 42 starts, about 25 games. And I can shut out that... I think six or seven times that year. That's unbelievable. <laughs> now, Fergie, when you take a look here, I was on, I gave Miguel Montero his World Series ring. You were on the field that day. We have the ring ceremony that's going to start momentarily behind us. 
What was it like for you to be on the field when the Cubs gave you that ring, and what did it mean to you at the moment? Well, you know, I was really surprised uh, when they had gotten a hold of me and Billy and I think Rhino, three of us, that they were going to give us rings. So I was quite surprised, and uh, I had to show up the next day, and you know, for the ceremony, uh, Santa wasn't there, and neither was uh, Ernie. They had passed away, but they had rings for them also. So they gave five rings to the Hall of Famers. Later on, they gave one to Lee Smith and, and Andre Dawson, but I was really proud of the fact that they gave me a ring. Now, Ernie Banks was your roommate. Did you know prior to the ceremony that they were going to give for uh, Ernie a ring? What did that mean to you? Well, they had mentioned, even though the players had passed away, they were going to put a ring in what they call the Hall of Fame uh, uh, room and, and have a, ri a, ri a ring for Ernie. Now, Fergie, you got to throw out the first pitch with Greg Maddox in Game 4 of the World Series. You did it in 2010, Game 5 with the Rangers, and you caught a pitch in 2023 from Adrian Beldre. Plus, I saw you throw an ear of corn at Johnny Bench in the Field of Dreams games. All right. What does it mean to be able to throw out those first pitches in those games? All of those seem pretty significant. Well, it's a lot of ceremony involved, and, you know, I enjoy that, especially when they they pick your name or they pick the individual to come out and do it. So I was quite proud of that. And I remember you guys coming out of the corn, and to me that was like a very surreal moment. What was it like for you to be with the team and your fellow Hall of Famers? That's a big memorabilia piece right now, the five of you in the clubhouse. What was that like? Well, that was that was fun, you know, seeing the guys. and We're all pretty healthy to be able to walk out there. And, and, and the ceremony was walking through the corn and, and having that opportunity to to display, I think, you as an individual with Cincinnati and also the Cubs. And that was a, that was a great uh, game because Field of Dream is really significant in baseball. And you and Johnny Bench, two of the greatest of all time. I mean, Johnny, legendary catcher, but hey, you did pretty good with Randy Huntley as well, man. One of the best catchers in Cubs history. Um, Fergie, when we take a look here, you were the last Cubs player to get a statue on Statue Row. And I remember you wore a nice 10-gallon hat you seemed really emotional about it. Rhino gets his uh, statue on June 23rd this year. What was it like for you, that whole process of getting this, you know, I know you worked with Lucella, the sculptor, and, and, and when you got to see the final product and had that whole ceremony, what did that mean to you? Well, it, 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 it kind of shakes you up a bit, knowing that the statue is basically an image of you throwing a pitch. Uh, the nice thing about it, and now they call it a sculpture, no longer a set. <laughs> the sculpture of me, pretty significant. And then they end up copying one and added it in my hometown, Chatham. So I'm pretty proud of that. It was a wonderful ceremony. Fergie, are you going to be at opening day? Yeah, I'll be there Monday. Now, Fergie, I know that you have a new Twitter account. Can I get your picture with you? And that yeah, Twitter account yeah. is FergusonJE2481. So that's Ferguson JE2481. So for any of our listeners that are interested in following you on Twitter, that's the place to go. That's where you put all the great pictures and all your interactions with the fans, correct? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, they get the opportunity to, to talk to fans or seeing what they want to ask about baseball. It should be fun. Well, Fergie, on behalf of all Cup fans, and I'd say all Rangers fans, you are a true legend, a Hall of Famer, not only as a player, but as a human being. Thank you for taking some time to talk to us. Pleasure. My pleasure. This is episode 27 of season three, Fly the W670 podcast. Justin Steele takes a tumble in Texas. We're going to talk a little roster moves. We're going to talk a little Rockies preview. But again, don't forget to uh, subscribe to the podcast and leave Crowley and I one of those five-star reviews. All right, Crowley. So the Cubs start the season uh, one and three. They're on the uh, air rickets as we are recording this, flying back to Chicago. But let's take a look at the standings, if you will. Well, if you take a look, Pittsburgh Pirates, they did it last year. They're doing it this year. They're coming out the gate strong, 4-0. and oh. Milwaukee, who needs Craig Council? They say three wins, zero losses. Cincinnati, two and one. The Cubs one and two and St. Louis one and two. Uh, you know, like I said, I think that the Cubs and St. Louis, they had really tough opponents with St. Louis facing the Dodgers and the Cubs on the road and the Cubs taking on Texas at home uh, at, on the road. So, you know, I understand it. It's early. We're not going to get too worried about standings right now. Remember how long Pittsburgh was the month of April in first place. Remember that? 
Yep, absolutely. So we do have some roster or, and some injury news, and unfortunately the injury news is not good. We talked in segment one about um, Justin Steele and, uh, you know, just – what happened? And, and here's Craig Council explaining what we know about Steele's injury. So it's it's a the MRI showed a grade one um, hamstring strain, which frankly is like like as him we saw him walking off the field is probably better than like at least I anticipated. Um, and and just how he was walking after the game last night, he's really he's much better today. Um, played catch today, uh, which is a great sign. Um, you know, I think it's he's gonna miss he's gonna miss the month of April, um, and then after that, you know, beyond that, it's really about just you know, uh, in a couple of days when his kind of like gait gets back to normal, laying out a plan, and then at the end of it, it's just what so it's how much can we do with his arm, kind of going up to when we're healthy, and then and then it's it gets more complicated with starters on these guys returning to play how many how many times are we going to make him go out, are we going to have him go out and pitch before he pitches for us so i mean a couple things going on here number 1 april he's gone <laughs> not great not great uh you know and then you don't know like when he comes back is he going to have to go to iowa is he got to do some rehab start so so at the very minimum 4 to 5 weeks no justin Steele. yeah it's too bad but uh you know if it's if it's just April, you know, we can, we can, you can kind of live with it. Right. Um, see what happens. Not, not the ideal start, but it, it could be worse. It could have been worse. I'm just, I, I'm trying to stay positive Crowley. I really yeah. am I, easier said than done maybe, but I, I am trying to stay positive. I am trying to, um, to keep the faith again, not, not thrilled with what, uh, with what went on obviously, but, uh, I'm more curious about why the Cubs called up Ben Brown and then used him the way they did. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm guessing they just wanted to give the bullpen. I, 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 re I really don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, is he supposed to be a starter? Is he going to come out of the bullpen? And so what's his role going to be? I thought I think for sure. I mean, they called him up and I thought he was going to be part of the rotation. Right. right? I mean, and I thought he was going to, they were going to give him an opportunity um, to be around the big league crew a little bit more, right? He he did not break camp with them. Was uh, moved down to AAA um, as we thought he would be, and um, um, it just it didn't was, happen that way. I, I'm just confused. I, I'm very confused at the way this played out. Right. I, I it didn't. I mean, the only thing I can think of is the only had him go a couple innings, which would kind of be like his, um, you know, when they kind of do their work between starts and then that'll set them up for starts. That's the only thing I can think of, to be honest with you. Right. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll find out, um, you know, a little, uh, little promo. We will talk to uh, our guy, Tommy Hadovy on Wednesday on the Mully and Haw show. So that'll definitely be uh, something that will be brought up for sure. Right. A lot of these starters, they run, they do a bullpen between starts and you could say, okay, well, Ben Brown did his bullpen and then he'll have three or three or four days where he could rest and then be ready to start. We'll see how it happens. We got official injury news. Uh, Ty, uh, Jamison Tyone was placed on the 15-day IL, retroactive to Monday. Patrick Wisdom was placed on the 10-day IL for his back, retroactive to Monday. Both are expected back sometime in mid-April. And then Caleb Killian was officially put on the 60-day IL, which allowed Garrett Cooper to get um, that roster spot. But, Dustin, we also have um, the Iowa Cubs. You know, for those of you that are interested, the Iowa Cubs, I Cubs, I Cubs. are going to be making their, uh, they already made their opening day start. But for anybody that's really kind of interested and are thinking, okay, hey, man, I want to go to Iowa. They have a really, really talented roster. When you look at that outfield and you say to yourself, okay, we got PCA in there. Um, we, we got guys like uh, uh, Brennan Davis, or Brennan Davis is not there. He's on the I.L., unfortunately, but you got uh, Alexander Canario, Pete Crow Armstrong. You got infielders, Matt Mervis, Luis Vasquez, Chafe Strump, Jake Slaughter. You got a lot of good pitchers that are going to be in there. Obviously, Ben Brown was called up, um, but Daniel Palencia, Keegan Thompson, Hayden Wesniski. We've gone to Iowa, you know, we, we've hung out there and it's a lot of fun. So, uh, hey man, that's a really good team. And again, High A won it the championship two years ago. Tennessee won it last year. I think it's Iowa Cubs turn, so I would recommend that everyone get out there and see the Iowa Cubs. 
Yeah, I uh, just drove through the whole state of Iowa two times over the past uh, couple of days. So, yeah, I might uh, I might just do that and head back out there and check out the iCubs. Absolutely. And so, Dustin, I have been trying and praying to the baseball gods that the rains will not open up. I'm nervous about this weekend. I'm going to be honest with or with this week because this, this weather looks like a mess. Yeah, it uh, doesn't look fantastic. Plus, it's going to be cold and rainy, right? So another part of this. But uh, it will still be a good time down there for Monday at uh, 35th at uh, Clark and Addison, of course. And uh, where where will we find Crawley running around uh, on Monday? I'll be everywhere, man. I You're going to have to come and find me, but I recommend going by the rooftop, the uh, Rig, Vines Wrigleyville, at, right next to the fire station. You might find me there, get with some uh, some prizes for some people. So, Oh, prizes. Yeah, head on out there. Here's what the Cubs have announced, right? Um, from 8.30 to 9.30, you can welcome the Cubs players back. They're doing something new this year. They're walking the blue carpet from the Toyota Highlander lot, which – right across from Wrigley, the players parking lot to Waveland Avenue. So they're going to walk across on a blue carpet. They're going to have the magnet schedule. It has returned for the first 30,000 fans. So you could stick in the bars a little longer, but don't wait too long because there's going to be season ticket holders holding the flag. There's going to be a flyover by the air force, John Vincent with the national anthem and Dustin. How about this? Ryan Sandberg throwing out the ceremonial first pitch and the hall of famers singing the seventh inning stretch. Very cool. Obviously, he's in uh, good enough shape to do that, so good news all around, no doubt about that. Now, let's get to the game. When we talk about last season, the Rockies were one of the worst teams in baseball, Dustin. They finished in fifth place with a record of 59-103. and 103. Yeah. First time, Dustin, they finished a season with 100 losses in franchise history, right? And so they were 22-59 and 59 on the road, but 37 and 44 at home. Usually Colorado has that home field advantage. They were just bad last year. Bad, bad, bad. bad. Real bad. Uh, Chris Bryant still missing in action. Um, well, is, is he only going to play against the Cubs? I'm kidding, of course. But uh, yeah, they're, they're not a good baseball team. And this is a, a time where the uh, Cubs uh, need to uh, feast, if you know what I'm saying. Right, but we said that last year, and in another boneheaded decision by MLB <laughs> schedule makers last year, the right. Cubs played the Rockies six times in September. Now, yep. the Cubs should have taken advantage, like you said, feasting on it, but they didn't. They, didn't, they swept no. the Giants, Wrigley, if you remember. It looked like the Cubs had over a 60% chance of making the postseason, right? But then they lost three of four to Arizona at Wrigley. Then they lost two to three in the Rockies in Colorado before getting swept by Arizona. So they went two and eight in that 10 game stretch. And the, the Cubs were able to sweep the Rockies at Wrigley. They did beat them four to two in that series, but losing two at three in between those two Arizona series, they never really recovered from the bad stretch. So Dustin, you think to yourself, okay, off season, there's pretty much, you have to replace every single position. You can do something right. 103 losses. Anything's better trades, free agents, they did literally almost nothing, Dustin. All no. they did was add a backup catcher and two starting pitchers that are mediocre. And not only that, they're pitchers that hit bats. They don't. They're not. They're not guys that strike out um, hitters. They, they 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 give up contact, which is the exact opposite of what you want if you play half your games at Coors Field. So the, I mean, it's I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, to be a fan of that team, woof, woof. Now, Dustin, here's their big pitching acquisitions, Cal Quantrell and Dakota Hudson. And the backup catcher, Jacob Stallings, key losses. They lost Brent Suter, relief pitcher, Chase Anderson, and Chris Flexen were both starting pitchers. So they've really done nothing to really improve upon a team that had over 100 losses last year. So like you said, time to feast, Dustin. Right. And Chris Bryant has already struck out seven times. Seven times. Seven times. He has a walk. He has struck out seven times. He has a walk and no hit so far. Yeah, you remember though. I, I just <laughs> I just don't understand what the hell happened to that guy. I mean, what happened? I I, I wish I, had, I you know what I think that's a question that we'll never really know. I, I really, you know, I talked to the writer about that article about Chris Bryant and and yep. you know it's it's I think there's a lot of stuff that goes on and and sometimes there's people that are you know, just more mentally ready for anything. And, and I don't know if it's between the ears. I don't know if there's something physical. I don't know. I wish I knew because, you know, when you looked at his first three years, he looked like he was going to be a surefire hall of famer. 
Yeah, no doubt. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not rooting against him. And now I just feel bad. Right. Well, we got starters for sure for the Rockies. For the Cubs, we're still, um, this is very um, uncertain and subject to change because of all the injury or because of the injury to Justin Steele. We haven't heard from manager Craig Council. He's kind of kept it to the vest. We know game one is going to be show to Imanaga. We don't know for game two, game three. We have a couple guesses based on some websites. But game one is Shota Imanaga versus Dakota Hudson. Shota going to make his premiere in, in, in MLB. And how exciting is that going to be? For Dakota Hudson, right-hander who primarily throws a four-seam fastball sinker and slider with an occasional change in curveball. Against Hudson, look for Cody Bellinger. He's 5 for 10 in his career against Hudson. Dansby, 6 for 12 with three doubles and four RBIs. So I wouldn't ever pick any guy like that on a rainy day for beat the streak, but they got some history against Dakota Hudson. So we'll see what happens. We will see. That's why they play the game, right? But uh, this is a optimistic feeling. I'm really excited to see Shota uh, making his uh, big league debut at Wrigley field. That's pretty awesome. Yes, sir. And game two, Javier Assad versus Kyle Freeland. He's the only lefty the Cubs will face in this three game series. More of a face fastball slider guy, occasional curveball. Once again, Cody Bellinger, 9 for 26 with five doubles. Dansby, 8 for 18. And hopefully Jan Gomes can get going. He'll, he's 5 for 8 against Freeland. Yep. Yeah, good. Again, and, let, let's, like you, let's feast. Let's game, feast, Carly. Let's feast. That takes us to game three. We, we think Drew Smiley versus Cal Quantrell. Quantrell relies on a fastball and also uses a cutter and changeup. Uh, against Quantrell, Bellinger's four for 11, and Nico is four for five. Hopefully, that gets Nico off the schneid. Yeah. Yeah. He needs to, uh, he needs to get it going. I, I don't want to see him back up at the top of the lineup anytime soon. That's for sure. Nope. And that takes us to hot and not. Mm -hmm. Dustin, after today's performance, any doubt Ian Happ would be up there? No, mm -mm. he is smoking hot. He is red hot, and he takes a very professional approach to uh, coming up to the plate. Really nice start for him. Five for 12 in the series with a double, two RBIs, and two walks. Also hot, Christopher Morrell, five for 14. He's got a triple, a homer, and three RBIs. So continuing to make loud contact. Now, for the Cubs, on the not side, uh, we mentioned Michael Bush, um, he, you know, one for nine. He did have three walks to four strikeouts. So, you know, at least getting on base, that helps somewhat, as opposed to Nico Horner, who's one for 10 with only one walk to three strikeouts. So he's got to get going. Yeah. Now, when we take a look at Colorado – and, and you're kind of watching, okay, who do the Cubs pitchers have to look out for? Ryan McMahon is their third baseman. He's six for 14 with two RBIs. And then Brenton Doyle, their center fielder, he's four for 13 with a home run and two RBIs. That's who I would be looking out for. They are hot. As far as the not, we have Nolan Jones, right fielder Nolan Jones. He is two for 16, does have two RBIs and one walk. And second baseman, Brendan Rodgers, he is 2 for 17 So I wouldn't worry too much about those guys. No, mm -mm, don't have to worry about them whatsoever. I mean, but th this is just, this is a series, Crowley. You got, you you must, again, I, I know I know everybody will say, Dustin, calm down, calm down. You, you have to win two out of three. And you really need to sweep if you have aspirations of actually playing meaningful baseball. Because guess what? All the games count the same. I know there's 162 of them, but they all count the same. So when you have the opportunity to feast, you must feast. And this is the opportunity the Cubs have against the Colorado Rockies. What do they say? You can't win a pennant in April, but you certainly can lose one? Uh-huh. I've heard that before. I've heard that somewhere before. I'm going to make my prediction here, Dustin, and I here's what I'm going to I'm going to preface it with something, okay? I think the Cubs are going to win two out of three. I do not believe they will sweep. And the reason I do not believe they will sweep is because of the weather. I think that when you have to sit around and it's raining and if it's delayed or God forbid, they got to play a double header, which again, usually when you play a double header, you usually win one, lose one. I, that, that to me is the only reason I don't see the Cubs sweeping is because of the weather. But be, I still think they take two out of three. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it, Crowley. I, I'm calling for the sweep. I, I think you make a great point, but I'll be a Joe Meatball Cub fan, no problem doing that. Um, and I'm calling for I'm calling for the sweep. And uh, you know, I think you know, will Chris Bryant have two hits over the course of three games? Will he Will he play? Will he play in all three games? I mean, I, I think that's something we're talking about. Will he play in all three of these games? Something we have to keep an eye on. Absolutely, but remember, last time when he was in Colorado, he hit no, home yeah, two yep, games. So. Yep, he did have a big series. All right, Crowley, that is a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram. Of course, we're on Twitter. You can also email us, flythew670 at gmail.com, and now you can watch us by subscribing to the 670 The Score YouTube channel. Crowley, have a great time down in uh, – Wrigleyville, uh, I know you will, even though the weather may not cooperate. I am going to uh, go to my uh, local watering hole, the Spring Inn, where you uh, they like to say you uh, you spring in and you stumble out. But being a Monday, I don't think I'll be stumbling out, but I will have a, a beer on opening day, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see a uh, Cubs victory and uh, another chance to fly the W, buddy. Absolutely. And I want to thank the Cub fans in Oklahoma for such a treat this weekend. It was a lot of fun. All the people that came up to us and talked to me about the podcast. And then I'm looking forward to seeing all of you at Wrigley Field tomorrow. Home opener, Ryan Sandberg, go Cubs. Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!